Today's story is interesting because of the events that took place. There's twists and there's turns, there's backstabbing, a hitman, prison escapes, and of course, murder. Unfortunately, there's not a ton of information out there for the public, but there is enough that I can tell the story. I also reached out to the local police department to get some information, but at the time this took place, their files were not kept digitally. It was just like paper files and stuff. And so they told me in order for them to get it, they would pretty much just have to go dig through boxes and try to find each paper, paper by paper. And I just said, no, there's no need in all that. I have plenty of information. I just won't have photos or anything like that. But what we do know about the story is that two men opened up their own bars and actually there used to be a building right here behind me and this is where this took place they opened up their own bars right next to each other in this old train depot that would have been here behind me it was only a matter of time though after both men opened their bars that one of them became jealous that the other one was getting more customers than they were this led to fighting and feuds between the two men that ended when one of the men was shot point blank in the head in his home an investigation led officers to a crazy murder for hire plot that sent a few people to jail only for one of them to break out and go on the run for nine whole years this story today from here in athens could be straight out of a novel because of how crazy it is this is the murder of tk hardy from here in downtown athens georgia Their bus says hybrid electric on it, but that's a diesel engine. That's definitely not a hybrid electric. That's interesting. Today's story takes us back to a different time. It was in the 70s. It's just that... Uh, you know, I know this one's an older one, but I thought the story was kind of outrageous and wild. So here I am right here at the old train depot where the story took place. Right here in what is this parking lot now, there used to be part of the old train depot. And they rented out blocks of it for a while to different businesses. Down at one end of it, there was a place called Somebody's Pizza. It was owned by Athens native John Mooney, and it was just your typical pizza eatery where you could order a pie, and he sold pictures of beer, and he always had some kind of sports playing on his TV. TK Hardy's saloon opened up at the far end of the train shed. It almost instantly became a popular place for the college crowd here in Athens, and before long, they would always have a packed house, especially on the weekends. Some of the artists who made it big from the Athens area, and I, I talked about them before, but R.E.M., the B-52s, Widespread Panic, they all played here numerous times to packed houses full of UGA students. And undoubtedly, these bands playing here at T.K. Hardy Saloon in front of all of these Georgia students, it almost surely lent to their success in the music industry. There is a shot, so you can see this road here and how it curves right here and then and then you can see this part of this building and then you can see TK Hardy's sitting over here to this side over time John Mooney started to become jealous as TK Hardy's crowd grew bigger by the night somebody's pizza stayed empty on most nights because everyone wanted to be around the corner at TK Hardy Saloon, John Mooney tried to combat this by discounting his pitchers of beer to half the price on weekends. And when that didn't work, he started walking down to TK Hardy Saloon and he would hand out flyers with coupons on them for free beer. After only a few times of John Mooney handing out these free beer coupons, TK Hardy confronted him and threatened to have him arrested if he came down there and did that again. Mooney took the warning and he stopped handing out the flyers and he went back to his pizza place and started trying to figure out other ways to bring in more customers and to sabotage TK Hardy. A short while later, the person who owned the train shed 
they decided that they didn't want to own it anymore. They didn't want to be under it anymore. So they opted to allow one of the tenants to buy the building from them. They went to John Mooney first, but John told them that he didn't have the money to buy it. And he pleaded with the owner to not offer to sell it to TK Hardy. The owner of the train shed pondered this decision for a week or two, but ultimately decided that they really wanted to retire and move away from Athens, and they didn't want to have this building hanging over them as they, uh, as they retired. They also later stated that TK Hardy had been nothing but good to them. He always paid his rent on time, and he was always so friendly, so they didn't know why he and John Mooney had this beef between them. Either way, they went to TK Hardy and offered for him to purchase the property, and TK Hardy obliged. He he came up with the money and he bought it. Um, you know, he's looking at it like his place is getting packed on, on a daily basis, and he was making a lot of money, but he could make even more if he wasn't having to pay rent. So he bought it, and they signed the paperwork, and TK Hardy became the new owner of the old train depot building. After T.K. Hardy purchased the building, John Mooney tried to stick it to him any way he could. He constantly failed to pay his rent, and he would call T.K. over the smallest little details and force him to, to come down there to, to fix things on his property inside of his building. And on top of that, every opportunity John Mooney got, he started arguments with Hardy over nothing. T.K. Hardy went along with it for a short while, but he very quickly grew tired of John Mooney's annex and he started the process of having Mooney evicted from the property. Before that process could end, though, T.K. Hardy would be found dead in his home, shot by a single bullet to his head at close range. Immediately after T.K. was found, John Mooney was law enforcement's obvious first suspect. The issues between the two of them were well known, and just four hours after T.K. was found, John Mooney was brought in for an interview. Mooney denied having anything to do with TK's death, and uh, at that point, law enforcement didn't have enough to prove that Mooney had done anything, so John Mooney was let go. At the crime scene where TK Hardy was killed, law enforcement really didn't find any evidence connecting anyone to the murder. There were no fingerprints, no DNA left behind from the killer, so after Mooney denied killing him, the case pretty much went cold. They had nowhere else to look. Four weeks later, law enforcement would finally catch the break they needed when another bar owner who knew both TK Hardy and John Mooney, he came forward and told law enforcement a wild story about a man who came into his bar the night before and claimed to be a hitman. The bar owner just thought he was drunk and talking nonsense, so he played along with him and started asking him questions. One of the questions that he asked him were, who have you killed that I might have heard of? the so-called hitman, his name was Elmo Florence, he tells the bar owner that he killed TK Hardy. The bar owner started getting suspicious, so he asked a few more questions and eventually got Elmo Florence to tell him that John Mooney had hired him to kill Hardy to stop him from being evicted, and so that TK Hardy's saloon would have to close down and his business would you know, grow in his eyes, I guess. Elmo Florence would go into detail about the murder, even going so far as to tell things that law enforcement had not released to the public. The, an officer that was in charge of the case at the time said throughout Elmo Florence's story, he offered up 21 details that they had not released prior to, details that only the killer would know. The very next day, the bar owner who Elmo Florence had told all of this to he felt that it was sufficient enough that he should report it, so he immediately contacted investigators here in Athens and told them everything. Investigators couldn't believe it. John Mooney was their only suspect, but they had no evidence tying anything to him. So had it not been for the so-called hitman, Elmo Florence, running his mouth at the bar that night, it's likely that they would have never solved this case. Within no time, officers tracked down Elmo Florence, and they sit down to talk with him, and and he admitted to everything. The Clark County Athens Police Department wasted no time and they started looking for John Mooney. For whatever reason, once officers went to arrest Mooney though, he was nowhere to be found. He was not at home and neighbors told law enforcement that they had seen him packing up all of his belongings just a day prior and leaving. 
A warrant was quickly issued for John Mooney's arrest, and then Elmo Florence, who they did have, he was taken into custody and arrested for first-degree murder. Two weeks later, law enforcement received a tip that John Mooney was staying at a relative's house in Cobb County, Georgia. And as soon as they got this tip, law enforcement wasted no time. They sent officers over, and John Mooney was standing outside when the officer pulled up. So he was quickly taken into custody and charged with TK's murder. When they arrested John Mooney, they searched his vehicle, and inside of his vehicle, they found several incriminating notes that John Mooney had written, one of which said clearly, see Elmo, if worse comes to worse, take the fall for the whole thing and claim it was a robbery gone bad, I will agree to take care of his wife and family. Elmo Florence's trial lasted just one week and he was sentenced to life in prison for TK's murder. John Mooney was also sentenced to life in prison, but because he wasn't the one who actually pulled the trigger, he was sent to a minimum security prison, whereas Elmo was sent to a maximum security. While John Mooney was at this minimum security prison, somehow he managed to work his way into a job in the kitchen where he was like in charge of the kitchen. So this gave John Mooney access to areas that other inmates didn't have access to. On March the 16th of 1980, after only serving 19 months of his life sentence, John Mooney organized his escape. Every day while at the prison, John Mooney and his crew, they were responsible for taking out the trash. They would have three or four trash cans and a guard would open the gate and watch them as they carried the cans out and put them outside of the fence so a trash company could come pick them up and then the guard would watch them come back through the gate and then he would lock it and walk back inside of the prison. On this day, the inmates did just that, but John Mooney wasn't one carrying one of the trash cans, but the other inmates carried the trash cans out, the, they set them down, and then the guard watched as the inmates came back inside and he closed the gate. So about 15 minutes after the guard and the inmates got back inside, John Mooney popped out of one of those trash cans. He had uh, like laid down in the bottom of the can and then they took a bag of trash and threw it over the top of him to conceal his body so the, the, the guard couldn't see him. So then the inmates carried him outside the fence and then, like I said, about 15 or 20 minutes after they walked in, John Mooney popped out. He um, started running towards a wooded area next to the property and he started shedding his inmate clothing. And then he had a woman that he had been talking to who was there to pick him up and he got in her car and they drove off. Because of John Mooney's position, he regularly missed count because he was in the kitchen, so it was nothing new for him not to be in a cell at the time of their counts. So it was two hours before anyone knew that John Mooney was missing, and by that time he was long gone. John Mooney stayed on the run for over nine years. And it wasn't until a new series was airing on television called Unsolved Mysteries that he would be caught. In Unsolved Mysteries' very first season, their third episode, they did a segment on John Mooney and the murder of T.K. Hardy. Immediately after that story aired, someone called in saying that they believed John Mooney was their neighbor. He was living in Scottsdale, Arizona using the name Robert J. Kelly. Within days of the Unsolved Mysteries broadcast, the Scottsdale Police Department served a warrant on this house and John Mooney was taken into custody. During the nine years that he was on the run, John Mooney had enrolled in college and he had become an accountant and he had also gotten married and had a child. None of his new family knew about his past when he was arrested, so it was a shock to all of them. In 2020, after serving 32 years in prison for T.K. Hardy's murder, John Mooney was paroled by the Georgia Department of Corrections and released. Although Mooney is now out of prison and he's living out here in the free world with the rest of us, he will be on parole for the rest of his life, meaning he'll always have to check in with a parole officer even when he's 90 years old. On top of that, 
anytime John Mooney wants to leave the state of Georgia, say for a vacation or anything, it has to be approved by the uh, parole board and he has to go through that rigmarole for everything. After John Mooney's release from prison, uh, his wife that he had married 32 years prior in Arizona, she moved down here to Georgia and as far as I can tell they are still married and they are together to this day which is extremely shocking after you know 32 years prior she learned out of the blue that her whole life had been a lie that uh, that you know John Mooney had lied to her about everything and then she had to raise this child on her own for 32 years without him but apparently uh, you know she loved him enough that she waited the 32 years and then came down here to Georgia to be with him. Elmo Florence was paroled in 2007. He asked for and was denied parole 15 different times after becoming eligible in 1994. But that 16th time worked for him and uh, they set him free, bringing an end to the story and the murder of T.K. Hardy. Now, T.K. Hardy Saloon is, has been long gone. This is a, a, an elderly home now, but at one time, this was a heavily populated like train depot, and it was, a, it was a, the place to go for all the college students. That is going to do it for this episode today from here in Athens, Georgia, and the murder of T.K. Hardy. I want to thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you're new here, go down and hit that subscribe button, then hit that notification bell so you get notified every time I upload a video. Thank you all. I will see you again in the next one. The next two are actually way more detailed stories that I have gotten for your request back for. So they're going to be very interesting. Thank you all. I will see you in the next one. Please stay safe and stay healthy. Much love to you all.